in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is the seven grace gifts, lesson number one, and we have entitled this lesson, The Trinity Endowments. I had to come up with a good term that kind of encapsulated everything God gives to the people of God for their benefit. And we'll just read this and let it explain itself as we go. Uh, The psalmist revealed to us that God is a very present help in time of trouble, and we're thankful that he is a help. But help also gets us out of trouble, puts us in a better place. God is present to help. Once you've been helped, it's time to move on. The Apostle Paul's doctrine affirms this. His epistles teach us that each member of the Trinity has graciously given the body of Christ a total of 21 different endowments. And we're going to look at what those are in this lesson. It's an introductory lesson. So we're going to look at each grouping, God the Father's gifts, God the Son's gifts, God the Holy Spirit's gifts. should be pretty simple to understand, though maybe after you see this lesson you'll think, wow, I've never seen that, never heard that, never been shown it, and yet it makes perfect sense. That's how this works. The kingdom of God makes sense once you understand it, and then often you're befuddled as to why you didn't ever see it before. We use a term, or I use the term endowment as a general term because each person of the Godhead bestows a different gift or a different type of help. And what we're going to see over and over again in this lesson is that the Father bestows grace gifts, and that's the subject of this entire curriculum for the next several weeks. The Father bestows grace gifts, the Son bestows ministry gifts, and the Holy Spirit bestows what Paul calls manifestations. We, in our vernacular, call those the gifts of the Spirit. It's a it's an okay general term, but it's not a biblically accurate one. We won't ever split hairs over it or try to go around correcting it. That's going to be a, a bottomless pit you're never going to fill. We're always going to call them the gifts of the Spirit, but Paul specifically calls them the manifestation of the Spirit. All right. Collectively, we call these the Trinity endowments, and it shows us that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are trying to help us by giving us abilities, graces, endowments, manifestations, all for the purpose of glorifying him and building the kingdom. But it also means every one of us has a job, a responsibility. We don't support, endorse, or to some degree even permit lazy Christianity. That's for the megachurch. Even the megachurch knows 10% of the people here do all the work. What about the other 90% of the dead weight you host there every Sunday morning for exactly one hour? Why don't you harness them? Why don't you tap into their giftings? Why don't you put a burden of responsibility upon them? Why bring the other 90% if you're never going to use them? What's the purpose of even having them if your messages are not discipling them to a greater purpose in Christ? Sometimes the answer is ego, ego, and ego. I have the biggest church in town. Well, not many of them are going to make heaven. I think the big, the church measurement will be how many you get to heaven with you, not how many you gathered together on a Sunday morning in this age, how many actually followed you to heaven with, in the resurrection? So the Trinity endowments will be enumerated below. They are all necessary to accomplish the kingdom's work. So we define endowment here as that which has been endowed. And so to endow means to be furnished with talent, quality, ability, function, etc. cetera. To, to receive an endowment means you've been given a talent, you've been given a quality, an ability or a function. And to that end, I want you to hear, because you're going to hear it over and over again, every one of you has been given an ability by God to do something for him in his kingdom. That's for every born-again believer, which means if all you ever do is come and sit, you are out of the will of God. Hear the responsibility of this teaching. If you've all been given an ability, a function, a responsibility, then if all you ever do in the church is come and sit and take notes... You're missing the bigger picture. And there will be an answer and a reckoning to be given on judgment day. This is where the the parable of the talents comes into play. And the the good master says, what have you done with what I've given you? And that term, talent, just means money. It isn't ability. But the principle is, with the abilities God has given you, what have you done to expand his kingdom? And one said, here, I took your five and made five more. I took your two and made two more. I took your one and buried it. And he that has a gifting and does nothing with it, Jesus says, cast them into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And take which was his and give it to the guy with ten. That's the kingdom. That's not Cookville Jesus. That's not America Jesus. That's Bible Jesus. 
Each of these three terms, grace gifts, ministry gifts, manifestations, are different in their function, purpose, and distribution. God the Father gives graces. God the Son gives ministry gifts. God the Holy Spirit gives manifestations. And all three of these are different. All three of these categories are different in their function, their purpose, and their distribution. There is no overlap. And we're going to see that over the next several weeks. There is no overlap. If the Son is giving a gift, there's no reason for the Holy Spirit to give the same gift. If the Father has given a gift, there's no reason for the Spirit to give the same gift. There's no overlap. They, they are each individual persons in the economy of the Godhead, and they each have a different gift to give to help the body. And to me, it says we're that messed up. We need the entirety of the Godhead working. And yet it also says we're without excuse. We should succeed because we have the entirety of the Godhead working on our behalf. These facts only stand to reason the efficiency and perfection of God doesn't require redundancy on his part. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is not building in redundancy because he doesn't fail. It's not like we're building a space shuttle and we need backup redundancy because it's a million moving parts built by the lowest bidder. Trillion pounds of thrust that strap six guys to it. What could go wrong? God the Father is not that way. This also means that, excuse me, the Father and the Son are not in competition. One gives one type of gift, the other gives another type. This also means that if prophecy appears in one list, its function, purpose, and distribution must be different than the prophecy in another list. I've spent weeks studying the Greek and the Hebrew prophecy back to the original context, and you're going to be shocked to know that anybody from a poet to a singer to a speaker was considered a prophet in the time of Paul. And it is only until the second century A.D. of the church age that the term prophecy takes on a strictly religious meaning. And that will help explain a lot of stuff. We as Pentecostals interpret things through our modern Pentecostal perspective, and we get it wrong. The Apostle Paul called Epimenides, a 7th century Cretan philosopher, a, a prophet. How in the world could a, a pagan philosopher be called a prophet? But Paul was using the typical usage of his day for the word. We come along in the TBN era and we translate everything the same. All right, we'll cover that in the third lesson. The existence of 21 helping endowments also testifies to how eager God is to help his people serve him, honor him, and finish their race. The fact that each one of us has the Trinity gifting and gracing us from every one of these uh, lists tells us that if we don't finish our race, that is totally our fault, not his. It's our fault, not our culture's. It's our fault, not some shameful thing of our past. It also means if you want to play the victim, you'll never finish your race. You can't help a victim in a victim mindset. But if you don't want to be a victim, bless God, you have the entirety of the Trinity pulling for you and you can win and overcome and finish your race. But it, please explain to me then, how does the bulk of the body of Christ fail to finish their race? It's also worth acknowledging that of the following 21 endowments, many modern denominations, theologians, and ministers only believe about nine or 10 are still necessary and functioning today. That is only the evangelist, only the pastor, only the teacher, only ministry, only teaching, only exhortation, only giving, only ruling, and only mercy are still operative today. So you take 21 endowments and you whittle it down by almost half with no rhyme or reason. They're taking something from every list and saying, mm, that one isn't alive today, that one isn't functioning today, mm, that one isn't alive, that one isn't functioning, mm, these have all been done away with. This doctrine is generally known as cessationism. Cessationists believe the supernatural workings of God, that is, miracles, healings, the gifts of the Spirit, have ceased. And if God is no longer supernatural, then, uh, then unfortunately he's no longer God. If God is no longer supernatural, he is no longer God. So then I ask, if the Holy Spirit is no longer functioning in the earth supernaturally, then how do people come to Christ? Because they can only come lest he convince them and give them a revelation of their sin and their need for Jesus. There is no consistent logic or biblical proof as to why 10 to 12 of the 21 Trinity endowments have been turned off or have ceased in their operation. I've had these debates for going on 30 years now, ever since I was in college. And there's never been a consistent, logical, concise explanation as to why this one and not that one. 
And why this one and not that one? And why this one and not that one? It's just, well, because. Because why? Well, because we've never seen it. Well, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Have you ever seen your brain? Does it mean it doesn't exist? I would think maybe yes in your case. <laughs> There's no clear logical explanation why only one of the father's endowments, two of the son's endowments, and almost all the spirit's endowments are no longer available to the church. Some affirm that all 21 endowments are still active, claiming to believe in their existence. However, in practice, they are actually functioning. They actually function as cessationists. Unfortunately, this means their lives, churches, and ministries will only function with about 43% of God's available help. So think about that statistic. If we take the perspective of, of a cessationist or even a practicing cessationist that we might affirm all 21 endowments with our mouth, if we don't have all 21, then what we're doing is saying, I'm only able to function with a certain percentage, not a full percentage, but a fraction of the percentage of God's help. And this may explain why not every Christian finishes their race. Because if you and I could function and, and serve and live for Jesus with 100% of the Trinity's endowments helping our lives, surely we could finish our race. Surely. I might even need to go back now as I'm thinking about it, and I'm upset that it's just now crossing my mind, and talk about the gifts of the Spirit, excuse me, the fruit of the Spirit as well, and bring this list up to 30. Because a reason a lot of us also fail is that we have hardly any fruit of the Spirit working. Now, that's called a fruit and not a gifting, where the others are called giftings, and maybe that's why I've omitted it, but we might could add it and bring the list up to 30. So with 21 Trinity endowments and nine fruit of the Spirit, there's no reason you should ever fail. And any place you fail, you're going to fail because you're missing one of the endowments or the fruit. So it should be easy to go and troubleshoot and say, I'm failing because I lack this fruit. And I have failed because I lack this gift. And the Bible commands us to covet earnestly. That is lust after the best gift. What is the best gift? An old AG preacher once said, the best gift is the one you need in the moment. That's the one you need. Which one do you need? The one I need. Which one's the best? The one you lack. For most American Christians, it's a pastor and self-control. With those two, my God, you can go a long way for Jesus. Without either one of them, you're going to fail and maybe go to hell. Amen. This lesson will briefly cover the Trinity's, the Trinity's 21 endowments, while the remainder of this course will focus on the seven grace gifts of the Father. So let's start off with the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I've kind of worked this out in a template over the next two pages. So I have curriculum on almost all of this in other places, but we're just going to briefly synopsize it and show you that there's so much more in the Bible than just being born again and going to a Christian concert and reading, I don't know, chicken soup for the soul. And if that's the, 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 the extent of your Christian walk, you're failing. There are only nine categories by which the Holy Spirit manifests. That is the Greek word phanerosis. These manifestations are divided to every man severally as he wills. So every man has the opportunity to be used in one of these gifts. But they manifest as God wills. They are given to profit withal or for the common good, as the NIV says. And we have in-depth lessons on this on Pod School. So if you want to jump to that website, podschool.org, and see the gifts of the Spirit, or maybe it's podschool.com. Is it .com or .org? Org. Some of our websites are .com. Some of our websites are .org. I can't keep it all straight. And the only reason, the difference is $5,000. Some of these website domains have been purchased, and to me to go in and try to buy them, somebody has them for five grand. I'm like, you can keep that website. I have the copyright on the name, so nobody else is going to take it anyway. But I'm not giving you five grand just for a dot com. The nine manifestations of the Spirit are, according to 1 Corinthians 12, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, special faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Those are the nine manifestations. Those are the nine categories by which the Holy Spirit manifests in the earth today. If a manifestation does not fall into one of those categories, it's not the Holy Spirit. And each of these has multiple facets to it, like 
I think discerning of spirits, that's you seeing in the spirit realm. That's you seeing angels. That's you seeing demons. That's you seeing the Holy Spirit as a glory cloud. That's you uh, understanding how things are working with, with a demon or even seeing the Lord Jesus. I find it humorous. I was raised Southern Baptist. Southern Baptists, generally speaking, are cessationists. Now, there's a lot of new neo um, continuous among the Baptists now because they're taking mission trips and they're seeing the supernatural and they have to be able to explain it. But what's funny is they would say traditionally the gifts of the Spirit have passed away, which means discerning of spirits has passed away. And yet they, they love it when they hear stories of Muslims seeing Jesus walk into their bedroom at Ramadan and telling them about his death, burial, and resurrection. That's a discerning of spirit. They don't believe in that, but they believe in the Muslim having a vision of Jesus. And I'm okay with both, but somehow rectify and be consistent in your theology. Now, for us charismatic Pentecostals, here's what will blow your mind. That's a pagan dead to God having a gift of the Spirit work in their life, which means you and I are not special when we have them. If a Muslim who's on his way to hell can have a discerning of spirits, see Jesus Christ and give their life to God, and they weren't even born again or Spirit-filled, then we should adjust our doctrine that says you can only be used in the gifts of the Spirit if you're born again and Spirit-filled. Then how did Balaam operate in the gifts of the Spirit? How did anybody under the Old Covenant operate in the gifts of the Spirit? They were neither born again nor Spirit-filled. So we're not special. And please hear me. You're not special if God uses you in the gifts. They manifest as he wills. Even Caiaphas, the high priest, did prophesy by the Holy Spirit that one should die for the sins of many. A pagan who's about to kill Jesus, he's prophesying by the Holy Spirit. He's being used in the gifts, not a special man. Probably in hell today, unless he got born again after the Messiah he crucified was raised from the dead. Anyway, lots to be said on the gifts. We just want to demonstrate that there are three categories of endowments from the Godhead. If we'll make full use of them, man, we can rip it up in life and be tremendous Christians for our God. Person of origin, these come from the Holy Spirit. Endowment is phanerosis. The Greek meaning is to expose, to view, an exhibition, and that's typically how I teach it. This is how the Holy Spirit gives an exhibition of his power. If you've ever been to some kind of sports exhibition, they show off their skills. I, I grew up going to martial arts exhibitions, and you would see them out there doing the amazing katas, and they weren't fighting anybody. They were just showing off what they could do, and it looked really cool. Sometimes you go to a basketball exhibition or exhibition game. They're just showing off what they're capable of. The gifts of the Spirit are how the Holy Spirit shows off his power to the people of the earth. To make evident to the understanding by proof. So when the Holy Ghost demonstrates his power, it's to make evident to the understanding of proof. The recipients are... The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, which means you're not special. You're not special. We grew up in circles that if you were used in the gifts and somebody else wasn't, you were special. Special in the head, maybe, thinking you were something when you really weren't. And then it became a, a fake factory of trying to make it up so you could appear more spiritual than your neighbor. Meanwhile, the Baptists and the Methodists just love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, win their neighbor to Jesus, go through hell with a smile on their face, which is better than most Pentecostals who stub their toe. Grumpy is not a fruit of the Spirit. Neither is hatchet face. If you're happy and you know it, then your face should surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. They're manifested... To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, so it's given to everybody. Everybody can be used in these. And sometimes in our services, it takes place after a service, the most unassuming person in our congregation will come up to me and say, I saw this happen during service. D does that seem like that would be real to you? And I, it's always accurate, like, yes. And even I'm blown away that the Lord let you see that? And that's my pride. The Lord let you? You who run me down? You who don't tithe? You who I have to bail out? God let you see? Oh, maybe God's letting you see that so you would get your tail in gear and start serving Jesus. Then I don't feel so bad that I didn't get to see it. These manifestations are divided to each believer individually as God wills, when God wills, not as we will. And this is important. It means we cannot turn them on or off. 
And if you've been in Pentecost long enough, if you've been in spirit-filled circles long enough, you understand that. We can't turn these things on or off. We can't turn prophecy on or off unless we're just preaching the simple gospel. Revelation says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That also gives us a better understanding of what prophecy is. It's not TBN Pentecostalism or just that. We can't turn on discerning of spirits. Right now, I don't see anything in the spirit. I see all of you taking notes and looking wonderful this morning and attentive. I can't make myself see angels, demons, or the Lord Jesus. Even Thessalonians says, the Lord Jesus whom you love having not seen. So we can't turn it on or off. We can't turn the gifts of healing on or off. And that's another ignorant misunderstanding with a lot of folks. Denominational folks will come over to Pentecostal circles and say, do you have anybody in your church with the gifts of healings? And we have to explain it doesn't work that way. Well, yes, it does. Son, how much have you operated in these circles? Well, none. Then please let experience teach you and be quiet. Nobody here has that. Well, the Bible says, listen, it turns on and off as he wills, not as we will. So come to our service. We can teach on healing and see what gift the Holy Spirit wants to manifest that service. We'll see if he wants to confirm his word with signs following. But if he doesn't want to, we can't fabricate it, in which case we just lay the hands on you and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. We'll do the word. If there's no gift, we'll just do the word. That's why we should study the Bible more than just chicken soup for the soul and Sunday morning only. There's so much to learn in this kingdom. How dare you only be a Sunday morning only saint? How dare these preachers only offer one service a week with a 30-minute sermonette? Sermonettes produce Christianettes. And Christianettes don't change the world for nothing. They can't even change their own world. We cannot turn these endowments on or off at will. The purpose is to profit with all or for the common good. The Holy Spirit manifests through believers when and how he sees fit for the purpose of blessing and profiting as many people as possible. A closer evaluation of each manifestation will reveal how beneficial they are. And I will add, you don't have to be in church to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be in church. Those Muslims that see Jesus on Ramadan, they're not in church. They're at home hungry. And Jesus walks in. I think in crazy Upper Cumberland Pentecost, we only want to use them publicly so we can show off. And if, if you're impressing Upper Cumberland people, well, that's a low bar. How about you impress Jesus? If you're just aiming to impress people, it's a low bar. The function, these nine manifestations of the Spirit manifest differently. Each manifestation is a different exhibition of the Holy Spirit's power. To that end, anything the Holy Spirit does today must be able to be classified in one of these nine categories to rip on charismatics. Every once in a while, it gets really, people get really excited when God starts giving people gold fillings. To me, that's the stupidest demonstration of God's power. And to be clear, it's not God. If any of you have ever been caught up in those movements that have gold fillings, that is stupid, that is stupid, that is stupid. It's either a demon or it's a forgery. If God is the healer, why not give them new teeth? If God is a healer, why not give them new teeth? If God is a healer, and why would God do something that only the dentist could confirm? I see the miracles in the Bible. People stand up in front of everybody. Lazarus is raised from the dead. Everybody hears about that. How do you confirm dental work? And God will give you new teeth, I believe it, because he's a miracle working God, but really gold fillings? That's stupid, 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 stupid. And the people that are suckers for that don't know their Bible, don't know their Bible, and don't probably know their God very deep. Uh, well, along that, with that are also those gems, the gemstones that come in. That's, I mean, even to say it, I feel like, we sound stupid. I, and I say it again, we're supposed to be, quote, word of faith people, but we don't know the word. So then I question our faith. If you don't know the word, you don't have good faith. The more words you know, the better your faith can be. And it ought to be watertight. We're going to war in a submarine with screen windows. And that's the word of faith movement. Glub, glub, glub. I don't believe I received wet ankles. I'm sorry, sweetie. They're about to be wet knees, wet thighs, glub, glub, glub. 
The five ministry gifts of the Son from Ephesians 4, 8, and 11. Jesus is the giver of these gifts. It's a different word. It's demata or doma, and the plural is demata. He gives these gifts to some men, but they are given to perfect every believer for the work of the ministry. Just like the manifestations of the Spirit, they're given to every person, but in a service, they're not, not everybody's operating in them, but they are given to individuals in the service for the benefit of everybody present. The ministry gifts, the demata, are given to some, but those some then perfect all. So once again, the whole kingdom is blessed, the whole body is blessed when this is done properly. The five ministry gifts are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And to some degree, all five of these are in the Old Testament in form. Apostles are sent ones that work miracles, and we see a pattern of that in the Old Testament. We know the prophets were in the Old Testament. Evangelists, Jonah is a great example of an evangelist. Pastors are spoken of more in Jeremiah than the entirety of the New Testament combined. All the judges were considered pastors in the Old Testament. All the kings were considered pastors in the New Testament. And Jeremiah considered himself a pastor. That just means shepherd. And then, of course, we had teachers as well. The person of origin for the New Testament is Jesus. The Holy Spirit manifests the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus gives the gifts of ministry. The endowment is demata, meaning an appropriate gift at an appropriate time or a proper gift at a proper time. Your life needs these proper gifts at proper times so you can be fixed. You can't perfect yourself. That's what the ministry gifts are for. These gifts are people, whereas the gifts of the Spirit are manifestations of supernatural power. These gifts are actual individuals. These gifts are actually individuals. The recipient is some. That means others are excluded. Not everybody is called. Not everybody is called to the, the five-fold ministry. Everybody is called to ministry, that is, being a servant, but not everybody is called to the ministry. The sum has been estimated to be 10% or less of the body of Christ. Some circles, it's all chiefs and no Indians. And if everybody's a chief, who would do the following? And I can tell you, being around preachers several times a year, we are all alpha males. And we can only get along for so long. Because we are all alpha males. Two and a half weeks on the mission field is about enough. And we have tested all nine fruit of the Spirit after two and a half weeks. And... Uh, yeah, we're ready to go home and be in charge somewhere else because I can't leverage over my brother in Christ, my fellow pastor, missionary. I can only submit so long when I'm used to running the show. And that's how it is even at a lunch table with a bunch of preachers who are opinionated on their doctrine. It's true. We love each other. And it's time for you to go home to your church now. <laughs> when do you go back overseas? Can you go tomorrow? <laughs> it takes a lot of humility to be a bunch of preachers in a room and submit to somebody else. The ministry calling is according to the will of God, not the will of man. There are many folks in the kingdom that take on the ministry calling as a profession, and this is not a profession. It's a calling. There are folks who will go to seminaries seeking the ministry or the clergy as a profession. It's not a profession. If you're in it for money, you're a hireling. Jesus condemns you. This is a calling. This is something you run from. This is not an opportunity to make money. This is something you cannot be content with until you fulfill it. The Lord makes sure you're miserable until you do the work of God. The purpose is for the perfecting and equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So the purpose of this is not to manifest the power of the Holy Spirit, but to perfect and equip saints. And this is why we have to have all five of these in our lives. The only one that shepherds a flock is the pastor. So that's the one we live under the most. But we need good teaching. We need evangelists working in our lives. We need the, the prophetic finger of the prophet correcting us. And we need the apostle who comes along and tells us the world's a lot bigger than our hometown and our little corner church. They come and go. They perfect the saints. They make impartations that we need. It also means you cannot be mature or perfected without them in your life. Any Christian that stays at home is an immature, imperfected, unequipped saint. The purpose of the local church is to receive the equippings and the perfections that you need. Yes, you can stream church, but it's like learning judo on a video. You can't learn a martial art on a video. You can't learn a martial art on a video. You have to get under a master. 
who can show you and train you with others. You can't perfect throws and kicks and punches watching a video. You can't even bring in your kid brother and say, stand here and hold your hands like this. I'm going to watch this video and try it on you. You're going to beat him up the first two punches and he's not going to be able to defend himself and you're going to feel like you earn a black belt after one video. Streaming church is like trying to get a black belt online. Streaming church is like trying to get a black belt online. Streaming church is like trying to throw a football with a tutorial online. It's not going to work. And a lot of Christians have greatly deceived and deluded themselves into thinking they're part of the kingdom if they stream church. You are not part of the kingdom. You are deceived. Person of origin is Jesus. The function now, the five spiritual endowments allow the called men and women to operate as ordained ministers to operate supernaturally as the officers of the New Testament church. Each office is distinct from the other, each having their own assignment and strengths. We might add graces, abilities, and assignment as well. Teachers are different than evangelists. Pastors are different from prophets. And all you have to do is be around these different ministry gifts and you totally understand it. It's like understanding the difference between a crystal cheeseburger a McDonald's cheeseburger, which seems to be about 60% fly ash at this point. I just had one the other day. I said, why am I even eating this? The kids wanted McDonald's, so we went through McDonald's. And I said, no, I'm better than this. No, I'm not. Give me a double cheeseburger. <laughs> and I ate it, and that, those two beef patties felt like I was just eating fly ash. Fly ash is just ash from a Coke oven. It's just ash. Like, what's the filler in this thing? Because it's not meat. It ain't cow material. This is ash. Somebody's going to a foundry somewhere and shoveling ash, selling it to McDonald's. They're mixing it with soy byproduct. Put a little bit of blood in there from the cow, and there's your beef patty. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I got off on that, but I'm thinking about it. It's disgusting. You know these different ministry gifts. What's the difference between a crystal cheeseburger a McDonald's cheeseburger, a Burger King cheeseburger, and then like a restaurant cheeseburger, then your dad's cheeseburger. All cheeseburgers, all very, very, very different. And how do you know? Because you've tasted and seen that the beef is good. And you have canine teeth not to be a weird vegan. Yes, vegans are weird. Yes, they are weird and often have a lot of health issues. Now, if all you do is eat red meat, you're going to be weird too. So I think we find a biblical doctrine called balance. Balance. Dr. James, why do we have canine teeth? Meat. Dr. James is a dentist. He understands how to exercise those chompers, really chew, chew, chew. That's an 80s after school educational video. Never mind. It means I'm getting older. The seven grace gifts of the Father. This is what we'll spend several weeks teaching on. We have one more, one more foundational lesson next week that uh, I think is going to challenge us and open our eyes to a lot. The Father distributes the grace gifts, and this is the word charisma. It is where we get our word charisma, but it has nothing to do with winsome personality. It's also why we're called charismatics. And it's a horrible misuse of the Greek because the spiritual gifts are not necessarily charisma. They're manifestations, which is phanerosis. But we're not called phanerosis addicts or phaneratics. We're called charismatics. Charisma. The root word for charisma is charis. It means joy. Woe. If your face is happy and it knows it, it should surely show it. Sometimes Pentecostals are the most ugly people in the world. They're grouchy, depressed, discouraged. You find more joy among the Baptists and the Methodists than you do the Charismatics. And the root for our namesake is joy. Charisma, charis. These grace gifts are effectively the individual believer's function or role in the body of Christ. The seven grace gifts, as Romans 12 tells us, are prophecy, so this has to be different than the manifestation of the Spirit, ministry, that is to be a servant, not full-time ministry, teaching, so that has to be different than the gift of the Lord Jesus called the teacher, 
exhortation, giving, ruling, and mercy. And this list applies to everybody. It's a grace endowment. It's a charisma, a grace gift, a gift given because of favor. And this is something you can turn on and off. Just like even for me as a pastor, that's one of the gifts I've been given. I'm a ministry gift. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. I can turn that thing on or off all day long as I see fit. I can't turn the gifts of the Spirit on or off. I can turn pastoring on or off. I can turn, I've been given a gift of teaching. I can turn that on or off. I have a ministry, a grace gift of ruling or leadership. I can turn that on or off. For what it's worth, and this is just me using me as an example for lack of anything else, as, as with a leading leadership or a leadership gifting, I can go into any place and very quickly feel out who's in charge and even begin to see what I could do to help. And then it becomes very difficult to not do something. So I just have to sit there whether it's at family reunions, whether it's among other ministries, whether it's among, I'm in somebody else's church, I've been called into a Bible study, I can sit there and quickly see what we could do better here. But that's a, a leadership gifting. Other folks, you get into a group of people and you, you don't see what's wrong, you just wanna exhort. You just wanna encourage them to do something great for God or you get among them and you see where you, these folks need mercy and you just wanna go down and hug on everybody. Or maybe you come in there and you see they need money. I can give. I can see you guys need help here. Uh, we need new workbooks. Can I buy them for you? Everybody's gift manifests differently. And this thing is already in you. It's innate. And you are probably already bumping into it and don't realize it. And you don't know what to do with it. And I'm hoping that and praying that after five, six, seven of these lessons, you'll be able to recognize what your gifting is and you'll be able to use it and lean into it and we can develop it better. So prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, and mercy. The person of origin is the father. The endowment is called a charisma or grace gift. These endowments are jobs, and uh, one translation calls it special functions. And I like that perspective better. These are special functions, and every one of you has a special function to fulfill in Christ. That means you can't sit. You don't just get to be a church member or church attender. We have to figure out what your special function is and let you function. There's another Schoolhouse Rock song, Conjunction Junction. What's your function? Connecting words is my function. Little Saint, what's your function? I don't know. Here's my function. We got to figure out what it is so we can connect you to the body of Christ. The recipient, all members have not the same praxis. That is, this is from Romans, the same work, office, job, special function. Every member has not the same special function, but you all do. And having then gifts, that is charisma, differing according to the grace that is given to us. Every one of you has a grace I don't have. And you have a grace your neighbor doesn't have. And we need that grace. We need you ministering it to us. The, the knee is different from the elbow. They operate similar, but they're different. And we need both knees and elbows. Right. Hallelujah. And your left ear is different from your right ear, but thank God you got two of them. And God's honest truth, everybody's are unequal. One sits a little higher, one sits a little lower, one sticks out more, one's a little bit more of a hugger, it's a little bit more clingy. Everybody's a little different. Thank God you got both ears, you look weird if you didn't. Huh? It's a joke. It's a bad joke, but it's a joke. <laughs> the purpose is to supply and aid, uh, to supply and aid the body, as Ephesians 4:16 tells us, that the whole body grows and builds itself up in love, and each part does its work. What part are you doing? Are you contributing anything? Again, this is going to be a series of lessons that's going to put a burden of responsibility on you. Paul said in Ephesians that the whole body, that is the body of Christ and the local body, it grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Another translation says as each part does its special work. So what's your special work? We can build this local church up if you do your special work. We can build up this local body if you'll do your special work. If you don't do your special work, we can't build this thing up. What work? The work that each member is graced to perform. So what's the function? 
I believe these seven grace gifts are distinct divisions or categories under which all the ordained works of the body of Christ, whether the local church or the universal church, can be organized. So I, what I'm going to prove over the next several weeks is that these seven grace gifts are, are categories. There's a lot of different ways to show mercy. There's a lot of different ways to show leadership. There's a lot of different ways to prophesy. There's a lot of different ways to exhort. These are categories of things that God does in the kingdom. And you may lead a different way than I lead. You may lead on the business. I lead in the kingdom. You're all called to lead in your home and you're all called to lead somebody to Christ. So there's different levels of leadership. We're all called to give. Some people give one way. Some people give another way, but we're all called to give. And there are those who really lean hard into giving. And we're going to see there's a lot of different ways to prophesy. Musicians were called prophets under ancient Greece. So there's one way to prophesy. But prophecy is different than teaching. Lots to look at. These are the seven categories of works that build and advance the kingdom of God. If you are born again, God has given you at least one of these gifts for his glory. The body's benefit and your advancement. And I will teach you that your 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 destiny is tied to this grace. And where Christians really hurt their lives is they reject whatever the grace is God's given them and they want to be something they're not. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace given to me. And by that grace, I outlabored everybody. By that grace, I outlabored everybody. By that grace, I outlabored everybody everybody. If you'll lean into your grace, you'll find your destiny. It's horrible though when you determine you want to be something you're not meant to be. Hands make horrible feet. And there are those weirdos, and I say that tongue in cheek, there are those weirdos that determine they want to be able to walk on their hands. Fine. And then they decide they want to do a hundred yard dash on their hands. More power to you, but you'll never be as fast as if you ran on your feet. Because hands make horrible feet. If you're a hand, be a hand and enjoy being a hand. If you're feet, be feet and enjoy the grace God's given you to be feet. But don't let somebody tell you you're not something you're supposed to be. Figure out from God who you're called to be and then grow in that. So review real quick. God the Father bestows seven grace gifts. Jesus the Son bestows five ministry gifts. And God the Holy Ghost bestows nine manifestations. And the focus of these lessons will be upon the seven grace gifts of Romans 12. Amen. All right, that's a lot to cover. 45 minutes on the nose. Feel really good. Even talked about McDonald's double cheeseburgers full of fly ash. <laughs> Father, we thank you for these lessons. May it bring an enlightenment, an understanding, and an adjustment to the kingdom. May people figure out finally where they're supposed to be, and may they embrace it and see how you promote them in that grace gift. May they recognize that your destiny, your calling, and your race for them is in that grace, not in something they imagined, daydreamed, or, or figmented up. Help us, Lord, help our understanding and anoint me to continue to teach and study and write these lessons in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have 15 minutes.